Uh, this is a little different from the presentations that I often make. Tonight I'm just going to focus on one question, whether or not it's possible to get rid of nuclear weapons. So let's begin. We can never get rid of nuclear weapons. It's idealistic to want to do so. We all know they're immoral, but it's not possible. Realistically, no one would ever give up the most powerful weapon ever invented. Deterrence keeps us safe and prevents another World War II. And even if you wanted to get rid of nuclear weapons, you can't disinvent them. I'm going to show you tonight why it is absolutely possible to think about getting rid of nuclear weapons. All of those arguments are either false or nonsense. The people who make those arguments are trapped in Cold War thinking. They ignore important facts, and they accept fanciful arguments as truth. This is a debate in which pragmatic arguments should play an important role. So one thing we often don't think about is that nuclear weapons as a field don't have very much data. Our thinking is not based on very many facts. Fields and disciplines that have relatively little data associated with them can undergo radical reevaluations. Consider cosmology in the Middle Ages. They had essentially eight pieces of data to work with, the sun, moon, stars, and the five visible planets. And so they had eight data points to use to generate an entire cosmological theory. Um, it's not surprising then that the <clears throat> Ptolemaic system ended up with the Earth at the center and the sun, moon, and stars revolving around it. And the Ptolemaic system was the given fact for 1,500 years. But one of the, f one of the <clears throat> features of a field with few pieces of data is that all you have to do is make an alternate suggestion and you can literally change the way people see the universe. So Copernicus comes along and, oh, 16, I can't remember, and suggests that the Earth actually revolves around the sun, moon, stars, and within a few years, everyone in Europe sees it that way too. So it wasn't possible to just change their minds. It was possible to change the way they saw the universe. So um, conventional wisdom, even conventional wisdom that's been around for 1,500 years can go into the dustbin of history almost overnight. Um, there are two reasons to believe that the ideas about nuclear weapons are equally vulnerable to sudden and radical change. First, there's an absence of real data. And there is less data underpinning ideas about nuclear weapons than ancient cosmology. There have been many tests of nuclear weapons in deserted areas, islands and oceans and semi palatinsk but there's been only one real field test of nuclear weapons. Hiroshima and Nagasaki was the only time that nuclear weapons were used and potentially influenced the thinking of leadership. And the crucial question is not what are the physical effects of an explosion that occurs in the desert. The crucial question is what happens in leaders' minds when there is an explosion over a city or over some military facility? That's the key question. And on that question, we have exactly one piece of evidence. And what that means is that this field is underpinned by one real piece of evidence. So the nature of that piece of evidence and getting it right is especially crucial. One of the things I'm going to show tonight is that our interpretation of Hiroshima now, it appears, in the last 20 years, was exactly wrong. Second, somewhat disconcertingly, our ideas about nuclear weapons have demonstrated a tendency to change over time already. They have a history of mutability. So consider the initial estimates of the value of nuclear weapons in 1945. Nuclear weapons were considered to be enormously valuable 
Their most important use, of course, was to prevent nuclear attacks, but they could also prevent conventional attacks. They signaled prestige and international standing. They assured success in war. And as Secretary of State James Burns said, they even assured success in negotiations. Nuclear weapons were, it was thought, the most valuable weapons humans had ever produced. But those initial valuations didn't last. Secretary Burns came back from negotiating with the Russians over the fate of Europe, chastened. Nuclear weapons did not provide unlimited diplomatic advantage, leverage. And the size of nuclear weapons value shrank. Defeats in Vietnam for the US and Afghanistan for the Soviet Union showed that nuclear weapons did not guarantee victory. And the size of nuclear weapons value shrank again. The Middle East War of 1973, the Falkland Islands War in 1982 showed that nuclear weapons didn't prevent conventional attacks or even fairly large wars. And the value of nuclear weapons shrank yet again. In the past three decades, more and more nations have shown that it's possible to be important without having nuclear weapons. And the value of nuclear weapons shrank to a mere sliver of its former self. The initial estimates of the value of nuclear weapons were off by orders of magnitude. And over time, their value has clearly diminished. Proponents of nuclear weapons ignore this fact. They act as if nuclear weapons have always just been exactly the way we see them today. But there's a certain point of view that you could say, well, you know, there's this steady decline in their value. What's to stop us from believing that they'll continue to decline in value down to zero? So our ideas about nuclear weapons do not have a large body of facts supporting them, and they appear vulnerable to sudden and considerable change. Two new factors are now affecting the situation. The first is that historians have carefully reevaluated the facts around the surrender of Japan and persuasively shown that nuclear weapons played a much smaller role in that decision than was previously thought. In fact, possibly no role at all. The second is emerging evidence that and, and facts from the Cold War which are used to demonstrate that deterrence is relatively reliable, were chosen selectively. An objective review of the Cold War crises seems to show that nuclear deterrence is much less robust and perhaps considerably less reliable than was previously thought. Let's do the two in turn. We'll start with Japan. And in order to see this more clearly, let's see it from Japan's perspective. Let's stand in the emperor's shoes. Emperor Showa, formerly known as Hirohito, was told since he was a small boy that he was responsible for the well-being of Japan. And in the summer of 1945, he faced a seemingly insoluble problem. Japan was fighting a war that it could not win, that it had already lost, in fact. But its military stubbornly refused to surrender. Military was powerful, radical, single-minded, and by the end of the war, largely in charge of the government. The warrior code, their warrior code, was based on honor, and it demanded that you fight to the death. They also believed, based on Japan's history, that it was always possible for a last-minute miracle victory. They were deeply opposed to surrender. The emperor couldn't command them to surrender. He, had, he was not a dictator. He had influence, not power. A figurehead monarch and a religious symbol combined, kind of like the pope and the queen of England rolled into one. So how could the emperor use his influence to persuade the military to surrender? Throughout the summer of 45, they were deadlocked. The military situation worsened. The U.S. submarine blockade that was keeping food out of Japan was increasingly grim. Then, in the first week of August, a momentous event took place that would change everything. A history-changing attack 
that would finally allow the emperor to maneuver the military into surrendering. The week began badly on Monday when the Americans bombed another city, this time Hiroshima. They claimed it was with a new bomb, uh, an atomic bomb, and they threatened a reign of ruin. Most of Japan's military men were not impressed. A so, uh, Deputy Secretary of the Army, Kwabe Toroshiro, wrote in his diary on the 8th, on Wednesday, he said, it was, I heard today that it really was an atomic attack on Hiroshima and it gave me quite a jolt, but we must be tenacious and fight on. When Foreign Minister Togo suggested on Wednesday, so two days after the bombing, that they have a meeting of the Supreme Council, which by then is the ruling body of Japan, to discuss Hiroshima, the military men on the council say, no. They didn't consider this new attack a game changer, not important enough to have a meeting of the Supreme Council about. And it's easy to understand why. The United States bombed 68 cities in the summer of 1945. If you graph the number of people killed in all 68 of those attacks, you might imagine that Hiroshima is off the charts because that's often the way it's presented. In fact, Hiroshima is second. These are immediate deaths. Tokyo, a conventional attack, is first. If you graph the number of square miles destroyed, Hiroshima is sixth. If you graph the percentage of the city destroyed, Hiroshima is 17th. Clearly, in terms of end result, I'm not talking about the means, but the actual outcome of the attack, Hiroshima was not outside the parameters of attacks that had been going on all summer long. Hiroshima was not militarily decisive. The bombing of Hiroshima was one more piece of bad news for Japan in a war that they were clearly using but it didn't change the strategic situation. Think about the soldiers dug in on the beaches waiting for the U.S. invasion. After Hiroshima, they could still fight. They were ready to fight. There was one fewer city behind them, but they had been losing cities all summer long at the, at the rate on average of one every other day. It might have been heartless for Japan's military to be unimpressed with the bombing but they were surely right in terms of its strategic significance. So the military continued on that week, meeting, talking, trying to find a plan that would get them better surrender terms, and unaware that the event that was going to change everything was looming above them. The hammer fell on Thursday, August 9th. Japanese leaders woke to find that during the night, the Soviet Union had declared war and invaded Manchuria, Sakhalin Island, and other territories. It was the end. When another great power joins a war, it usually affects the balance. They knew it was the end. The Soviet Union had been neutral. They'd signed a neutrality agreement in, uh, I believe it was April of 46, set to run all the way till April of 41, set to run five years to 46. But the decision, the Russian decision to enter the war created insoluble problems for Japan's leaders. It might be possible to hold off one great power attacking from one direction, but anyone could see that it wouldn't be possible to hold off two great powers attacking from two different directions at once. The Soviet declaration of war was strategically decisive and it had been obvious months earlier. In June, the Supreme Council had had a meeting to talk about the future of the war, and they said Soviet entry would determine the fate of the empire. Not surprisingly, when the thing that they had said was going to be decisive happened, they immediately met in emergency session. The Supreme Council meets on Thursday, and they talk for the first time in the war about unconditional surrender. But even at that point, the military couldn't quite bring themselves to surrender. They were going to lose face if they did it. And then somebody had a smart idea. Why not say that the bomb was the reason that Japan had to surrender? No one would blame the military for losing if they lost to nuclear weapons. Sakamizu Hizatsuna said in his diary and in his post-war memoir, 
It was in science that Japan was defeated. So the military did not bring shame on themselves by surrendering. In ending the war, the idea was to put the responsibility for defeat solely on the atomic bomb, not on the military. This was a clever pretext, quote unquote. So the emperor was able to talk the military into agreeing to surrender, and he went on radio and said that they were surrendering because of a new and most cruel bomb. And the war ended. It saved Japan from further destruction. It kept northern Japan from being conquered by the Soviets. It preserved the institution of the emperor, at, it turned out, although they couldn't know that at the time. I think anyone would have done what the emperor did. I, I would have. But actions have consequences. And using the bomb to explain the surrender had profound consequences because Americans listened to the Japanese. We believed them. They said, we were beaten by a miracle weapon. And we said, hey, we built a miracle weapon. This is great. It was in the headlines. And government officials came to see nuclear weapons as a remarkable, psychologically unique weapon that could force a stubborn, recalcitrant enemy to surrender. The Cold War seemed to ratify the importance of nuclear weapons. And among nations, they became the currency of power. The emperor told a little white lie and inadvertently created a myth that nuclear believers have used to change the course of history. Now, I'm not or arguing that nuclear weapons are not that bad. The fact that you can drop enough conventional bombs to create some damage that's pretty bad doesn't make nuclear weapons not that bad. Uh, nuclear weapons are enormously destructive they are the gravest danger we face. Bombing Hiroshima killed 90,000 people in a day. It did not, however, coerce Japan to surrender. The destruction and the danger are real. The special power is not. Nuclear believers are sure that nuclear weapons have special, unique psychological capabilities. The fact is, they are wrong. In the first and most important evaluation of the weapon's capabilities, they got it wrong. There's been one real field test of nuclear weapons, one data point for building a theory about why or whether they're important. It now appears that the nuclear believers interpreted one data point exactly backwards. They thought nuclear weapons mattered, but in this crucial case, they seem to have had little impact at all. The second factual revision I want to talk about is the historical record which they claim proves that nuclear deterrence is safe and reliable. And it is. Nuclear deterrence is safe and reliable as long as you only view some of the evidence. Scholars in nuclear armed states look at the Cold War and they say, see, nuclear deterrence worked in every crisis. I have snuck the Gulf War in, even though it's technically not in the Cold War. They are ignoring important facts. Consider Cuba. Proponents claim it is proof that nuclear deterrence works, most important crisis in the Cold War. The Soviets put missiles into Cuba. There's a risk of nuclear war, and they take them out. So what could be clearer than that? But they don't talk about Kennedy's decision. Kennedy knew if he blockaded Cuba, he ran a risk of nuclear war. During the secret meetings they had for a week, they mentioned the risk 58 times. I went back and counted. If nuclear deterrence means that leaders see a risk of nuclear war and then they pull back, how is it possible to explain Kennedy's decision? Don't get me wrong, I love Kennedy. I think he's a great president, but in this case, he risked nuclear war. Take the Middle East War, 1973. Scholars in nuclear armed states talk about Henry Kissinger putting US nuclear forces on alert to warn the Russians not to move a paratroop battalion to Egypt. They say, see, deterrence worked. But the question is, what about Sadat and Assad? 
they, everyone knew nu uh, Israel had nuclear weapons. It was reported in the New York Times. So the question is, why weren't the leaders of Egypt and Syria deterred by Israel's nuclear weapons? Why doesn't this evidence count when we think about nuclear deterrence? 1982, Argentina's leaders ordered an attack on the Falkland Islands, which they call the Malvinas. Why didn't the UK's nuclear weapons deter that attack? Take the Gulf War. Kevin Chilton, at one time commander of all US nuclear forces, said in an article in Strategic Studies Quarterly that the Gulf War is proof that deterrence works because Secretary of State James Baker delivered a letter to the Iraqis before the war and said, if you use chemical or biological weapons, the US will make the strongest response possible. But Chilton says is proof, and then the Iraqis didn't use chemical or biological weapons, and Chilton says that's proof that deterrence works. But if you read the letter closely, it draws three red lines in the sand. Don't use chemical or biological weapons, don't set the oil wells on fire, and don't make terroristic attacks against our friends and allies, in other words, Israel. And as we all know, the Iraqis crossed two of those red lines. They set the oil wells on fire and they fired Scud missiles at Israeli civilians. Does that mean deterrence works one time out of three? Again, successes are highlighted while failures are quietly ignored. So the consequences of any failure of nuclear deterrence could be catastrophic nuclear war. And as a result, you could say that for deterrence, failure is not an option. It's not enough for deterrence to work 95% of the time or 96% of the time. It has to be nearly perfect, vanishingly close to perfection. The evidence shows instead of working every time, it failed a number of times during the Cold War. Leaders saw the danger of nuclear war and plunged ahead with risky and aggressive actions. None of those failures led to nuclear war, but that was the result of luck, not because deterrence works like magic. The best way to see the functioning of luck is to think about the U-2 incident during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Saturday, the height of the crisis, the most dangerous moment, a guy goes out to, for an air sampling mission over the North Pole. His navigational equipment malfunctions. He's flying along, it's snowy, there's tundra underneath. He doesn't know where he is. He flies 300 miles inside Russia. They see him on radar, they scramble MiG fighters to go shoot him down. He eventually figures out from the stars that he is totally in the wrong neighborhood and radios back to Alaska and they scramble F-102s to come find him and rescue him and bring him back so the Russians don't shoot him down. But it's the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis, which means some mid-level Air Force official has ordered that all of the conventional air-to-air -air missiles be removed from the F-102s and replaced with nuclear air-to-air -air missiles. The only armaments those planes had were nuclear missiles. Now, if those two groups of fighters had found each other, there'd have been a nuclear explosion over Russia and likely a nuclear war. They didn't find each other. But that was because of luck. It had nothing to do with the perfect functioning of nuclear deterrence. So Ward, you're saying that even though nuclear weapons are scary, that nuclear deterrence doesn't work? I am not arguing that deterrence doesn't work. I think it does work some percentage of the time. Ordinary deterrence works some percentage of the time. Harsh penalties can deter some criminals. Nuclear deterrence seems to work sometimes. Cold War leaders do se seem to have been restrained by the fear of nuclear war sometimes, but sometimes isn't good enough. Even if nuclear deterrence works 90% of the time, that's unacceptable. Any failure could be fatal. We can't afford mistakes. It has to be perfect. Government officials insist that nuclear deterrence is perfect. They talk about it as if it's some kind of marvelous machine that whirs along without any help from us. It can run safely forever. 
But nuclear deterrence is not a mechanism. It's a relationship, a relationship between people, a threat, consideration of that threat, and a response. The problem with relationships is that human beings, we are fallible. We're all of us, even government officials, capable of breathtaking folly. We are by our nature imperfect. If nuclear deterrence is a relationship between human beings, and if human beings are inherently imperfect, then nuclear deterrence is inherently imperfect. It is bound to fail one day. It isn't safe. It's Russian roulette. If we continue to play, one day we'll all lose. Third, for a minute, just let me demonstrate that the case for nuclear weapons has surprising vulnerabilities. Uh, it's a commonplace that you can't disinvent nuclear weapons, or to put it more vividly, you can't stuff the nuclear genie back in the bottle. Um, you say you want to get rid of nuclear weapons, and often you'll get some realist shake his head sadly and say, son, I admire your idealism. You're quite a nice young lad, but you can't disinvent nuclear weapons. And this argument has won debates for 50 years. Its power comes from the fact that it is absolutely true. You can't disinvent nuclear weapons. It's also, however, absolutely irrelevant. No technology is ever disinvented. Don't get me wrong, technology disappears all the time. If you don't believe me, just try to get technical support for anything that's more than five years old. <laughs> technology goes out of existence. It doesn't go away by being disinvented. It goes away one of two ways. One, better technology comes along. Or two, people realize it was dumb technology and abandon it. Consider the penny farthing. These 19th century bicycles were difficult to get up on and dangerous to fall off of. But nobody said, you can't stuff the penny farthing genie back in the bottle. <laughs> better, better bicycles came along with two wheels the same size, and penny farthings were simply abandoned. No one had to sit down at a workbench and disinvent penny farthing technology. This pram from England in 1938, I don't know if you can see this, but mom is wearing a gas mask. <laughs> And Junior is inside a hermetically sealed chamber with a little window so he can look up and see the sky and a gas mask chimney. This technology did not have to be disinvented. It was dumb technology. No one wanted to take Junior for a walk in the middle of a chemical weapons attack. <laughs> Finally, the Hiller VZ-1, my favorite. Invented by the U.S. Army in 1953, it is an amazing engineering achievement. A platform about six feet across with a helicopter blade underneath it. Spins around really fast. And it can lift a single soldier 15, maybe 20 feet in the air. I mean, it is real Buck Rogers stuff. Of course, some people called it the here I am totally defenseless, entirely exposed, and completely vulnerable death platform, which may account for why it went away without having to be disinvented. The question is not whether nuclear weapons can or cannot be disinvented. That is entirely a red herring. The question is whether they are smart military technology, and on the face of it, that seems unlikely, since no one has found an occasion when they wanted to use nuclear weapons in almost 70 years. The genie argument is smoke and mirrors. But it does have something interesting buried in it. I think we should pay <coughs> attention to it, because I think it's psychologically suggestive. It tells us something about the thinking of nuclear believers in their minds. Nuclear weapons are the genie. Nuclear weapons are magic. Take your nuclear weapon out, rub it, wave it around, and people will do whatever you say.
If you look at nuclear weapons from a pragmatic perspective, it's surprising how strong the case is for banning them. There is actually quite a strong case. Not because nuclear weapons are immoral, although they surely are. Not because nuclear weapons are dangerous, although that danger is certain beyond doubt. But because nuclear weapons are not just immoral and dangerous, they're immoral, dangerous, and clumsy weapons. They're, they're messy. They leave a trail of poison downwind wherever you use them. Drop a nuclear weapon on your enemy's troops, and the radiation can blow back on your own troops. This is the famous 1976 study by physicists Frank von Hippel and Sidney Drell. They tried to construct a surgical Soviet nuclear attack on the U.S. just aimed at missile silos, air bases, submarine bases. This carefully limited attack, the result? 20 million people die. Even when you try to use nuclear weapons in a limited way, vast numbers of innocent civilians die. You want to destroy a building in a city, you've got to blow up three quarters of the city to do it. We don't often think about it, but nuclear weapons are weapons with severe limitations. It shouldn't surprise us they haven't been used in almost 70 years. The whole trend in warfare is away from big weapons. The trend is towards smaller, more accurate, more precise, more intelligent weapons. This is the future. This is what the future looks like. This is a four-inch drone called the Black Hornet Nano with a tiny camera that flies around the battlefield and peeks behind obstacles. Increasingly, nuclear weapons look like dinosaurs out of a technologically less sophisticated past. If the proponents who seem to believe in nuclear weapons, if they're right that nuclear weapons are magic, then disarmament is impossible and proliferation is inevitable because who would give up magic weapons? But if nuclear weapons are clumsy, blundering, overly large, expensive, outmoded weapons, then the case for disarmament looks very different. The fact is, our ideas about nuclear weapons could well change a great deal. There's not much real data behind current ideas that justify their possession. The one real data point, Hiroshima, looks like it was badly misinterpreted. And nuclear deterrence can be shown to be reliable only if you ignore important evidence. Key arguments in favor of nuclear weapons are rhetorical tricks rather than sound reasoning. The weapons have real, pragmatic limitations. I believe we are on the edge of a paradigm shift about nuclear weapons. It's increasingly clear that the ideas from the Cold War are simply wrong. That's not surprising, actually. No one does his best thinking when he's afraid. We stand on the edge of a radical rethinking of nuclear weapons. And it may well be that when we, when we come out the other side of that rethinking, we will decide that it is not only possible, it is sensible and prudent to ban them. Thank you.